Today, the biggest and baddest G-Class is the AMG 65, a 621 horsepower V12 SUV that blasts 0 to 60 in just 5.1 seconds and costs a whopping 166,000 pounds. When you start to look at the price point where the G lives, you're talking real money. This is a hugely expensive truck. It's a throwback, but they've kept updating. It's just a timeless thing. The G-Wagon is incredibly far from being a normal SUV. They don't change it because they don't have to. They're still stamping out the same body style. They're still cranking out the same big, beefy, solid axles underneath because it works. In a sea of similar-looking SUVs, the G-Wagon stands out thanks to its unique proportions and boxy stance. The G-Class became an icon because it looks the same as it always has and can do anything. I can drive this vehicle up into the mountains, I can take it to the opera, I can drive to a restaurant and I will always be noticed. It's amazing. It goes anywhere. Remember, luxury has a lot of different meanings. For some people, luxury is Rolls Royce. For other people, it's just, I want something cool that I don't see anywhere else. Well, something that looks like a brick driving down the street is completely different. Today, the G-Class is considered a symbol of luxury. Yet when the machine originally is conceived, that's not the intention. The saga starts in 1973, thanks to a very personal request. The Shah asked for a vehicle that was able to provide border patrol in his huge country. So that was the initial, let's say, spark that ignited the whole story. The Shah is the Shah of Iran, and in the early 70s, he's a major shareholder in Mercedes-Benz. He asks the company to build an off-road military 4x4. Well, there's only a handful of SUVs that have military backgrounds, and G-Wagon's one of them. Initially, the brand is hesitant. At the time, no one understands the potential of the SUV segment. But when the Shah places an order for 20,000 machines, the brand is compelled to act. Royalty has that sort of pull. Two years later, the machine is finally ready to test. They prove the powertrain in an indoor, off-road laboratory. Then crunch the suspension with massive hydraulic posts. And finally, crash the entire machine to prove its structural integrity. It travels the world to be tested in the most toughest environments. The development program rumbles throughout most of the decade and stretches from German coal fields to the Arctic Circle and even the Sahara Desert. These vehicles have, of course, been tested not only on firm ground, but also under extreme desert conditions. By the time 1979 rolls around, the Shah is out of power, but the machine is ready for production. This thing was designed as a military vehicle, and they never watered it down. At any point, what makes the G-Wagon so cool is how tough it is. The thing's all made out of steel. There's no lightweight parts here, and it's big and heavy and chunky. It looks like a military vehicle, because that's what it was. The military chooses this car, and I think folks thought that it could never be a normal car. Then Mercedes lent the model to the everyday customer, and it took off. The first generation debuts with six different body styles that all feature a heavy-duty ladder frame chassis. Yet the real star is the all synchromesh transfer case and full differential locks. On normal roads, power is applied to the rear axle as in normal cars. Four-wheel drive can be selected for cross-country driving, and in addition, a specially reduced cross-country gear can be engaged. It's very difficult as a designer to say at the beginning of a project, I would like to develop an icon. What helped is the boxy design, the functional nature of many of the elements. If you ask a little kid to draw a car, 
many would use the boxy design to show what a car is. Since the vehicle's inception, the car industry has gone through radical change. Yet remarkably, inside of the Graz facility, you can still find craftspeople who go back to the beginning. We have a large group of veterans who are naturally quite proud to have been here since the beginning, or at least from early on, and who have experienced every new G-Class product development along the way. I've been at the facility now going on 41 years. I started as an apprentice on September 1st, 1976. Then I completed my certified mechanic training and came to work here on the G in 1980 after serving in the military. The G-Wagon's famed toughness starts in the body shop, where artisan welders continue using old-school methods. The frame is built between 90 and 95% by hand, without automation. It's the only car on the market produced in such a fashion. A worker uses a chain-driven hoist to lift the massive floor pan to the line. Then two craftspeople wheel the rear structure over and lift it into place. Here we have the first assembly station of the G-Class body shell. Here is where the floor pieces are placed as well as the interior side panels. Jigs go on. Artisans weld using hand torches and massive welding guns. Next, a craftsperson fits the front firewall onto the body and clamps it into place. Before another round of welding begins. The second of the 17 stations is perhaps the most critical. Here, two craftspeople walk a body side into a massive jig, just before an underbody moves into place. The main assembly is a challenge, but the station behind us, the framer, where the shell is attached to the undercarriage, frame and interior, is certainly one of the biggest or most important. The specialists work in concert both inside and outside the machine. It's a highly challenging ballet that's shockingly calm. Remarkably, the G-Wagon body has been built the exact same way since day one. One could say it's a living museum of the automotive industry. Robots rule in the majority of today's mass-produced car factories. However, in Graz, the onus is on the man instead of the machine. Today's variations consist of left driver, right driver, steering wheel here, or the length, long or short versions, military grade. That reflects the complexity. It can really only be achieved today at a place like this, something robots would have a very hard time doing. Craftspeople do the welding because of the complexity. The intricate details give them a very personal kind of satisfaction. The G model is certainly one of the best all-terrain automobiles on the market, if not the best. And here we work on the vehicle by hand. Emotions are built into the car here. Robots don't really suit the construction of this car. Every body requires 6,000 different welds, and each one is done by hand. We have down 5 meters of magnet. 
There are five meters of welds, welded seams. The G is welded together from about 800 parts, and then another 12 meters of sealing welds are added. to the framer, they rotate the vehicle over and weld the bottom of the floor pan into place. At this station, we see how intensely the car gets worked on. This is certainly one of the stations where workers really need to put their backs into it, where we can see how it all comes together, where we realize how much time and how much work goes into it. It takes nearly 38 hours of hard work to construct each shell. Yet the real challenge is finding talented craftspeople capable of doing the job. It is tough to find folks who do this level of craftsmanship. During the machine's nearly 40 years of production, more than 1.8 million welds have taken place inside these walls. The external structural components have gone unchanged since 1979, but internally continuously improved to the point, in my opinion, of becoming the best sport utility vehicle in the world. Next, a worker preps the top of the vehicle before two craftspeople lift the roof panel on and permanently join all the panels together. Then it's time to send the partially built body to the second line, where they mount the front fenders, bonnet, and doors. A technician must look at and actually feel the surface to check for flaws, something which can only be done by hand. Robots have yet to solve that issue. I say, thank goodness, the professional knowledge of the body expert comes again into play, and it can only be done by hand. The professional knowledge on display is frequently a family affair. We have many examples where the father was here, the son is here, and even the grandson started to work here at the factory. We also have many, many families that own a cheap gas and would never give it up for anything in their life. Body shop manager Wolfgang Paul and his daughter Bettina Puches are one of the countless G-Wagon families. I actually also drive a G-Class. It's as if I get to connect my private life with my work life. I live for this machine. This is my own car. I drive it every day to work. It's an 83. I'd call it a civilian military vehicle. I also use it as it was intended to be, frequently off-road. I've driven it in Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, Romania, Czechoslovakia. I love going any place with intense off-road travel. My daughter works here too. She also traveled with me. She had her first driving experience at 14 in the Sahara in Tunisia. Caught the virus, so to say, and now has two G-Class sport utilities of her own at home. And she works here on the G-Class in assembly planning. Thanks to my dad, I grew up with the G-Class. As a result, I now live with the car I grew up with, the one I'm passionate about. It's my job. That's perfect. The vehicle is over 30 years old and still does its job today as it did before. Don't even ask me about the mileage. It has for sure over 500,000 kilometers on it, but serves its purpose every day without complaint. No electronics, no extras, pure G, as we say. I've lived with or driven my dad's G-Class since the age of 12, and since that time it's been my passion, either on trips or just as a hobby. Whenever I see one, it's like, oh, a G. Like I said, it's a hobby. G-Class is a hobby of mine. 
For some, driving a G-Class is a hobby. For others, it's the only way to get from here to there. If you're somewhere where there are no roads and you need to get somewhere, the G-Wagon and maybe a Toyota Land Cruiser and a Range Rover are your picks. I mean, there's really not much else. Traveling from point A to point B in remote terrain has been the G-Class's calling card. It's a unique form of off-the-grid reliability that stems from years spent perfecting the machine's journey through one of the most unusual factories in the automotive industry.